What's up, Eldorado? I'm your host, Jaden Lum, and I'm here with Cesar Valdez. Welcome to another episode of the Hawk Talk podcast. So, to my knowledge, you graduated from Valencia, right? Yes, I did graduate from Valencia in 2010. What brought you to El Dorado? Um, interesting story. So, it wasn't by choice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love being at El Dorado, though, so I'm glad I, um, I'm here now. But five years ago, this is my fifth year at El Dorado, and this is the fifth year of the wellness program in this district. And five years ago, uh, they hired on five wellness specialists, and they put us where they thought we would better fit. Mm -hmm. um, and there was someone else at Valencia who they thought that they would be good for that fit, and then so they put me here on El Dorado. Um, we were both Spanish speaking, but their Spanish was more uh, fluent. Uh -huh. uh, and as we know, uh, Valencia does have a large uh, Latino population, and then El Dorado has the second biggest Latino population, so that's why they placed me here. They fit us personality-wise too, with like the counselors and the administration at the sites. So I'm glad that I'm here on El Dorado. Yeah, that's super cool. I actually, I just moved here to El Dorado in like Orange County. Oh, wow. And so, I mean, I feel like El Dorado is just very, very supportive, especially with counselors. Mm -hmm. That was a really big thing that I felt was so helpful at El Dorado was the like different amount of counselors we had and how helpful everyone was. Mm -hmm. So I'm very thankful that the school district does that. That's really cool. Yes, I am too. And I'm glad that they provided this position for students who struggle with their mental health. Yeah, and speaking of mental health, how, like how did you get into like Wellness Wednesdays and like creating that type of material? So Wellness Wednesdays started because my primary job is to see students one-on-one -on -one or in group settings, but I felt that there was an element missing on reaching the student, what we call tier one and tier two interventions. So every student. So I figured that something like a little nugget of knowledge each week might be helpful for some of those who read it. So I try to come up with helpful tips for students to read and to really gain some insight from it because I can't see every student, nor do I have that ability to, right? Nor are they gonna be referred to the counseling office for that. But if they can read something online that might be helpful, I think that's a huge win. And that's really what influenced me to do those Wellness Wednesdays, essentially just promoting mental health with the whole student body. Yeah, that's, I, I love it. I see them every week and it's mm -hmm. like, it's really inspiring. What's your, like your main intention behind it? Like your goal? My main goal is, and has always been, uh, to raise awareness. Uh, I think that is a very simple task that I can do to promote mental health and raise awareness for different type, type of mental health issues. Um, and that's what I do in my job as a whole. And that's actually something that was my biggest talking point in interviewing for this position, you know, is mental health awareness. So if I could just sense a little snippet of knowledge every Wednesday, I'm hoping that can help someone who reads it. I noticed that, you know, if something happens in real life, you include it in your Wellness Wednesday. So you'll mm -hmm. tie it to like a holiday or an event. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I do have strategy when it comes to Wellness Wednesdays. You know, um, every year I make the calendar of what I'm going to be talking about each month. What really helps me are those quote unquote national months, uh, such as National Suicide Prevention Month. That's all of September, so that gives me a lot to talk about um, through the month of September. Uh, national Depression Awareness Month is October, Mental Health Awareness Month is May. You know, so it gives me good insight. And of course, there's a holiday, so gratitude and mindfulness just tie in really well with it. Or if I read like an interesting article or hear a really good podcast, and I think I can get some of that, pull some of it, and share it with my students, I think it would be very beneficial. An example would be this past Wellness Wednesday, we talked about how to regulate your central nervous system. So that's how I got it. I got it from a podcast. And that really influenced me to really talk about it. It came in like perfect timing. I think the day that you talked about that, I had like a presentation that day. I was nice. like, I was like super <laughs> nervous about it and the email came through. I was like, oh my God, this is perfect. Yeah, everyone <laughs> gets nervous all the time. Anxiety is normal, you know, it's just how we deal with it. Yeah, I think that's, that's really, really good advice that I think not a lot of people are super aware about. Being able to control those nerves rather than letting them control you. Exactly. As a teenager, you know, obviously teenagers are still learning and they're mm -hmm. still growing up and they're trying to figure out what works for them, what doesn't. What do you suggest to those that are, are trying to kind of balance it? 
Um, I think if you don't balance it as a teenager, that's perfectly okay. Uh, only because it's really hard to balance it with all these hormones that you have no control over. Um, however, adding to that, I think there are specific skills that you can use to really cope with the stress that the world has to offer you. You know, life is stressful, and I think stress is a normal thing. Anxiety is a normal thing. Anxiety disorder is not normal, but anxiety, the emotion, um, is. You know, uh, we feel anxious all the time about different things. We feel sad about different things. We feel angry about different things. Mm -hmm. Those emotions that people label as negative emotions, quote unquote, aren't necessarily negative. They're valid emotions that we feel for a reason. Um, so if someone is feeling those emotions on a day-to-day -day basis and they want to cope with them, they should figure out what coping skills work for them. If I were to tell a student, oh, maybe journaling can help, and then they try it for two to three weeks and it doesn't help, then we're going to try to work on other coping skills. But what I don't like to hear is when a student says, oh, I've tried that before and it's only one time. Yeah. You know, in order to cope with life, you need to develop healthy coping skills. And in order to develop healthy coping skills, you need to practice them consistently. Like any skill in life, coping skills need practice. They need to become a habit in order for them to actually be effective. So you mentioned journaling. Mm -hmm. So personally, that's something that I resort to yes. when I'm having like a stressful day or it's wonderful. Yeah, I just mm -hmm. like I have a lot on my mind and I I can't get the words out. I'll resort to paper. You mentioned like consistency. Mm -hmm. So would you say that it's something that's like fit it into like a routine or would you say that it's because personally I just go to it when I need it. So what would you say you know would be most effective? I think first starting off as a routine, just so you're getting used to it, right? That way, when you do need it, it's more likely to be more effective, right? However, if it's effective right away, then just do it when you need to. You know, you don't need a journal all the time because, you know, you're not always going to be stressed. You're not always going to be going through something. But definitely try to practice it so that when you are going through something, it, can, it, it has more of an impact on you and your life. And that goes for any type of coping mechanism. Any right? type of coping mechanism, deep breathing techniques, mindfulness, yoga, meditation, exercising, all those things can really do wonders if people have the intention of getting better. Coping mechanisms have always been something that have always interested me because mm -hmm. it's, it's different for everyone, and I love that. I love that it can go from journaling to dancing to mm -hmm. sports yes. to, to anything and I think um, just going back and forth on the topics we've discussed today finding healthy ones are so so important for having a sense of stability yes that's a great word stability you want your life to be stable manageable right yeah. but like I said earlier stress is going to come mm -hmm. And if you have a stable life, it doesn't mean that you're not stressed. It just means that when those stressors happen, you have a better handle of it. And that's what it means to be mentally fit. How did you gain this passion, if I may ask? Yeah, so uh, that goes back to, you know, when I was younger. Uh, none of my siblings, you know, graduated from high school or went to college. Uh, I have four siblings who are older than myself. Uh, and they struggled a lot in high school. They struggled a lot with their mental health, with addiction, um, alcoholism, just different types of issues. So growing up in a family like that, it really inspired me to want to help others. And because none of my siblings, you know, graduated from high school, I always just imagined, what if someone was there to help them out with that? You know, which is why my passion does lie with helping adolescents. Because who knows? what impact an adult would have had in their life and how their lives would have changed. I think that's another important topic is just um, not forgetting that everyone has a different story. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to be cautious about, you know, what you say and what you put out there in case that, you know, someone, they're not going through what you're going through. It could be worse, it could be better. And keeping that in mind is super duper important. I love that. You know, I always tell just people in general, like, treat others with kindness. You don't know what another person is going through. You don't know what battles they're facing internally, at home, or here at school. You know, so choose kindness because you don't know their story. And I wanted to touch up on...
the Wellness and Prevention Center. Yes, yeah, so the Wellness and Prevention Center is an organization that I volunteer for in Southern Orange County, and they help students in high school and, and middle school settings um, get therapy support for their addiction problems. Um, it's very substance abuse and addiction focused, so a lot of students who go to that um, organization for guidance are referred from their own schools. So I was volunteering there and just, you know, because I do have a passion for helping that specific population, um, and it, is, it was such a great experience for me. And it's a great resource for me to share to other students, because sometimes rehab isn't something that they're comfortable going to yet, so the Wellness and Prevention Center can be the first step. And now, like regarding the Wellness and Prevention Center, um, like whether you want to go to help or get helped, mm -hmm. um, what would you like? What was your process in doing that? For the Wellness and Prevention Center, you know, it is based in Southern Orange County, so most of the referrals did come from Southern Orange County, uh, such as San Juan Capistrano, Alyssa Viejo. Um, but most of those referrals came from schools. Uh, a lot of the students here in Northern Orange County, what we call it, wouldn't necessarily be referred to there because we do have other resources that are a lot closer. So if students are looking for resources related to substance or drug addiction, uh, they can come to me or one of my, the counselors and we can get them connected to Care Solace. And so you mentioned like drug abuse. What were some of the drugs that you like encountered being a problem? Um, some of the biggest drugs that I worked with in regards to student abusing them would have been weed and nicotine. Those <laughs> were the biggest ones. Not fentanyl exactly, but opioids. Yeah. Uh, and the intention of them was to use the opioids and not fentanyl, but as we know yeah. nowadays it can be laced. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there are a lot of other opioids out there that aren't necessarily um, as potent and as deadly as fentanyl. Um, but there was students who would be addicted to those at some point in their life and then get referred to the Wellness and Prevention Center. You mentioned that they weren't trying to take fentanyl. Mm -hmm. They were trying to take opioids that ended up being laced. Yes. And that's one of the main dangers of fentanyl, correct me if I'm wrong, right? Yes, and nowadays it, it is, and I, it is a huge red flag. Uh, students who I worked with at the Wellness and Prevention Center, when they would use opioids, fentanyl is an opioid. However, any type of drug can be technically laced with fentanyl. And it is a synthetic opioid that's actually meant to help people um, with pain and for really heavy procedures, such as um, heart procedures or brain procedures. Uh, and it can be very beneficial. That was the intent of it. What we know nowadays, though, is that it is illegally being distributed and created in labs um, all around the world and shipped to, you know, the United States for use. It's very cheap to make, so the dealer actually makes more money off of it. The problem with that is because things can get laced, students nowadays have to get their drugs illegally. It's different if an adult were to go to a marijuana shop and to buy marijuana. That stuff is vetted, that stuff is tested, so they're okay with smoking. However, if a student is to go get their drugs illegally, marijuana, cocaine, K, whatever it is, that's all susceptible to being laced. The students will not know if it's laced or not until they have a reaction to it. Fentanyl is known right now as a big problem for teenagers because like you said, drugs are being laced without their knowledge and mm -hmm. they're being sent to <coughs> hospitals because yes. they're overdosing. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, very, very small amount that is needed to cause a reaction in someone. Yes, so the amount, everybody, first of all, everybody's body's different, yeah. right? However, what research has found is that it's a very small amount. Just imagine a penny and imagine the date on the penny. That is enough to kill a person. And that is just the regular fentanyl. Now there's hard fentanyl, which is a hundred times more potent than regular fentanyl that can actually kill people like mass massively, you know. And the problem with fentanyl, another problem with fentanyl and the overdose that people are undergoing is the time slot to get help is really dramatically small. So I'll give you an example. If someone is overdosing on heroin, paramedics have about 20, 30 minutes to respond to them, get them the appropriate help. With fentanyl, if someone is overdosing on it, that 
window of opportunity gets cut to two to three minutes. That's not enough time to get the help. So typically if someone is overdosing on fentanyl, they're more likely to die than someone who's overdosing on heroin. It's pretty frightening, right? It's <laughs> very scary, especially since it's, it's something you, you can't necessarily control. Exactly. Uh, we aren't able to control it right now, you know. We can't control what kids take. We can't control what's laced or not. All we can do is support and educate mm -hmm. the best of our ability. It's very hard hearing about all of this. I don't want to say that it hits close to home, but so I came from L.A., Mm -hmm. And when I lived in L.A., there were a lot of kids that were like, here, try this. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I have some. Like, come, yeah. come with me. Like, let's try it. You know, peer pressuring. And I think that that's something very vulnerable. My personal opinion on peer pressuring is that, you know, it's a reminder that you don't have to say yes, no matter what the circumstances are. Mm -hmm. And especially on El Dorado's campus, there's always people here that are going to support you. There's a safe way in saying no. And it's, it's very important to surround yourself with people who, who want what's best for you. Yeah, and I completely agree. And I think LA has a huge epidemic right now. They're doing amazing steps right now, which is great. You know, LA Unified, LA County of Department of Education, and LAPD are all teaming up together to really tackle this problem because they've seen more deaths than we have on their campuses related to fentanyl, them, right? Yeah. And to jump back on, you know, the support system aspect, I think having a huge support system can really be beneficial when it comes to peer pressure. The problem with, you know, the label as using drugs, I think using drugs as a teenager has been such a norm. And there isn't a profile for someone who uses drugs. All it takes is that one time where you accidentally take something that was laced mm -hmm. for you to actually end up in a hospital. Students on our campus that might be listening right now, and you know they also want to help. Um, how would you suggest that we do that? I think if you are a person who genuinely wants to help, you will notice the signs of someone who needs it. You know, you would have the skills in that moment to listen and to care for them. The biggest thing that you can do is if you think, "Wow, this is out of kind of out of my league." I feel like you really should talk to someone about this. And if they're still hesitant, you can reach out to myself or a counselor of a concerned friend, right? If we're talking that level. I feel like another message to students, um, don't be afraid to get involved. I was the student that never got involved, never wanted to do anything. I was just doing my own thing, getting my grades. And I feel like getting involved at school really makes the experience 10 times better. You know, joining programs, joining clubs, talking to more people, getting outside of your comfort zone, mm -hmm. that's really gonna help you grow as a person. Absolutely, and even research suggests that students who do get involved tend to do better with their mental health and overall succession of life. You know, because they're not just focusing on all the stuff that are going on at home, at least they have a place to come to school where they can be involved and cared for. Yeah. So student involvement is huge, and there's a positive correlation to that and overall successful mental health. Yeah, I think if if you're really feeling lonely and if you feel like, you know, you have the world on your shoulders or so much heavy feelings and heavy emotions that you're going through and you just don't know what to do with them or if you feel like you want to start working on parts of yourself that you know are unhealthy, reach out for help. You know, those are good indications that you should probably talk to someone. You know, if your life is being impacted by your mental health on a day-to-day -day basis and it's really hard for you to function, go see a counselor. Go get connected with myself or one of your own counselors. Go talk to a parent about it to see if they can get you connected with a therapist. If you need help, it's okay to ask for it. There is a misconception about mental health and that that's a negative word, right? Like mental health. Mental health is actually just the our, how healthy is our mental state, right? If we're able to cope with adversaries in life and the stressors in life, and sometimes we feel like like not good about it, but then we're able to cope with other stress, like that's normal. Our mental health fluctuates, our mood fluctuates. It's okay to feel anger. It's okay to feel sadness. It's the duration and how impactful it is on your day-to-day -day living that can be a red flag. It's research that one of the main reasons that teenagers 
like end up taking drugs is because of a way to cope with their mental health mm -hmm. and it's a very <coughs> sad fact but it's true and that's I think the point of this podcast and this episode is to inform others that if you're struggling with mental health that there are resources that you can come to that are healthy and you don't have to resort to drugs because as we've heard there are tons of bad outcomes that can come from that and it's at the end of the day not going to help you get better exactly you know taking a hit of something just diffuses your problems momentarily but once that high is gone your problems still exist mm -hmm. you did nothing to actually solve them or fix them or cope with them so to echo your point there are resources out there so if students are struggling with any type of drug issues addiction or even just mental health problems go talk to a trusted adult go talk to one of your counselors go talk to myself we can get you the tools that you need to really live a successful life if you give us the opportunity to but i always say in order to get the help that you need you do have to want it yes. and and another reminder is that it's it's a judgment-free zone mm -hmm. um i personally from experiences i have yet to meet someone on our campus or in this community that has been just in general, not even when it comes to mental health or drug abuse, just in general, not supportive of a student or someone on this, like in this community wanting to get help. Yes, exactly. And I think help-seeking behavior is so common nowadays. And I think your generation, specifically Gen Z, with social media, you guys really advocate for help-seeking behavior. Go seek help if you want it. Even doing this podcast at a high school, wow, that's amazing. You know, you're essentially teaching other students, it's okay to reach out for help. And in my experience as a professional working here, uh, I think this generation is doing a good job reaching out for help. However, there are a lot of students who don't, so hopefully they do yeah. and get the help that they need. Yes. I definitely agree with you. It's okay to not be okay is something that I found super important when mm -hmm. I needed that. And that's kind of my goal for like this whole episode was kind of just to come on here and to let other students know that, you know, if they're going through something similar, they can relate at all, that it's okay. Yeah. And it's perfectly normal. And I also wanted to bring you on here because mm -hmm. I know you have a lot more experience and you can offer more knowledge than I could as as a teenager. Um, so I do appreciate you coming on here. Absolutely, a lot. you were wonderful. I loved your insight about all these things. Thank you. you, know? you and your personal experience matters too, and I think your story, the one that you're sharing right now, I think it's gonna resonate with a lot of students who feel similarly. So good job. Thank you, thank yeah. you so much. Um, I, I, I honestly love this a lot though. This was, this was a, I feel, um, an episode that needed to be talked about. I agree, and I'm glad that there are students on campus such as yourself and this team that are willing to make time for this. You know, mental health is so important and it's not going away, and who knows what this episode can do for those who listen to it. Thank you so much for being on this podcast. This was a wonderful experience for both myself and everyone that's going to listen to this and everyone's going to be able to get their own insight and their own opinions. I want to also thank anyone that's listening right now for supporting DMAA and just being there for us and listening to us and help spread information and knowledge on this topic. We really appreciate it. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for tuning into the Hawk Talk podcast. You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or on Buzzsprout. Come back for the next episode where we will be just as amazing.